the <laughs> official trailer. Yeah, have you seen this? Um, I have not. I meant should... to, and then I'm an airhead, so <clears throat> hold on. I feel like we should you should watch it and right now and I'll just let okay. it roll and I'll put it into a cut later so that people can see it. That's a good way to start a podcast, I think, right? Yeah. Here, here's yeah. the official trailer. We launched we didn't even launch it yet. We're launching it came I got it today, literally from the editor. And oh nice. I downloaded it, downloaded it. I'm super stoked. All of my revision of edits are in it. And it sounds good. This is the this is the trailer for Witness Underground. Okay. Hi, I'm Rhett Sutter, and I'm doing a demonstration tape on the modern audio equipment that our studio has, just in case you want to come and record in our modern studio. Nuclear Gopher was a record label and online community of Jehovah's Witnesses who all did indie music. I like you cut it just before Reed falls off the wall. It just yeah. blew up, but it all stayed in these weird little bounds. Witnesses can listen to music. It's not like a footloose situation where like the preacher's like, no music ever, but stuff is frowned upon. You need to really be aware of that disco beat because that disco beat invites the demons. This is not inviting the demons, it's Lionel Richie. They think that any moment now, God is going to destroy the world. At 17, I basically thought to myself, what am I doing? Is this how I want to live my life? Like, do I even believe this? If they just treated people all right and had some kooky beliefs, I could totally live with it. But friends who committed suicide because they're gay and they're a witness, everything just changed. <laughs> Music was my savior at that point. The moment people started taking it seriously is the moment that someone would start to, well, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. We start talking and she's like, well, so if we split up, would you still be a witness? What I actually said was, no, I don't believe any of it anymore. And I never saw her again. It's your wife. Yeah, I never physically saw her again. It was an orphan, Nuclear Gopher was very special. It created a space for people to be eccentric and creative and also as healthy as you could be in that culture. And while it lasted, it was like the best. Yeah, okay. Yeah. How does that feel? A movie about you, your life. Your yeah. <laughs> well, now it's a movie trailer. <laughs> for being honest, it's always it's always felt a little weird. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, uh, that's really that's really solid. Like that's th there were just it was just really tight, and I really like how it. Uh, I like how the music worked along with i mean that was just was that really how long is that is it only a minute long that's two minutes long two minutes long that was solid yeah i'm pretty stoked i hired this editor from trailerden.com his name is robert, robert hamilton and he's like such a breeze to work with i sent him just the just the uh, picture just the dialogue as an audio track just the soundtrack as an audio track and just the sound effects as an audio track there's not a lot of sound effects in this but there's a few and um he took that and three weeks later he had he created this cut and it's i basically had zero edits when it came to the story or the visuals just like mm. very very technical details like i had a list of like 20 things with audio and then i gave him my mix to like i want because it was very at the beginning it was like um the soundtrack and the dialogue was competing because he mm -hmm. didn't he like had level sound at like just zero but Got it. The dialogue is like all mids and so i asked him to take a, a EQ and just like dip the mids and uh, make sure that the dialogue feels prominent and it's yeah. not competing with the music. Yeah. And I showed him, I taught, like showed him in detail about how I'd like that to happen and how I use this one effect called mastering, which is like a basic EQ wave that's very, looks like analog. You can like really drag things around. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just sliders. And he just like did, ex it sounds exactly like what I wanted. First take. It's so cool. Well, from a purely technical perspective, 
playing on you know uh, phone speakers, like which is really suboptimal. Right. <laughs> everything was crisp. Everything sounded really right. Um, so yeah, I mean that sort of like mid presence ducking concept and all that. Well, well executed, like well done. But I mean, also just editorially, it's just it's great. Yeah, I was blown away. And everyone I've shown it to, they're like, "How do, can I hire that guy? I have a film. I want to." <laughs> I showed it, I put. I joined this class of like 150 other filmmakers and yeah. um, producers, and this is one of their recommended trailer guys. Like, it's a friend of the director who runs the class, and um, his name's Justin Giddings. And I put it on the group page, the Facebook group page, and people were just like, uh, "Wow!" Even Justin, he's like, "That's a fucking amazing trailer. I'm like, solid." <laughs> Uh, nice so yeah i got only f good feedback i couldn't agree more i couldn't agree more i mean i've seen pretty much everything that you have uh shared with me uh in the last 742 Two years. years it feels like <laughs> <laughs> Dude, the 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 persistence to stick with something over this extended period of time is quite impressive uh um killing myself to do it but it's also the most exciting thing in my life so it feels i've always wanted to like have a film in the world and so that feels really good you gonna uh you gonna do another film after this that's a great question i would like to say yes and that's what every distributor wants to know <laughs> mm -hmm. um i have a couple ideas but nothing as solid as this and like as much of a fire under my ass as this one was at the moment but i have a couple ideas and a, and a person i want to work with on a Mostly, I guess you could say like ecological, um, how like global climate change or ecological destruction problems that we have in the world in that vein of society. Like what are some of the solutions and like go explore the solutions. And uh, I have a couple people I wanna work with on that. But I have nothing in the works in terms of like, this is a solid plan and I'm ready to go. But it's like a concept I've been working on for a while. And, well, you've been working on all the shorts and all the other stuff related to the, um, XW the rest of the series. XGW series. Yeah. Yeah, and that's true. Are, are you planning to continue that? Yes. Yes. That is, um, that is still going. And I have, I already cut, like I have like a season one, like the concept trailers and a bunch of like teasers about the concept. And then like two really big full length, like 18 minute long shorts that are really follow two people, um, like get deeper. And, and then a couple of shorter segments that are like six or eight minutes long. So those mm -hmm. are, those are out and those have been out now for almost two years. Um, cool. and then I took a pause to work on this feature and then now I've got, I already cut like another six episodes, six or I think it's eight episodes for season two that are shorter and tighter and more concise, um, with completely different new people. One guy in Mexico city, uh, two different people in Milwaukee and uh, a couple out in Colorado that are like old time ex Jehovah's Witnesses who were like the guy that was like Lloyd Evans but like from the 90s he was the Lloyd Evans of oh, the wow. 90s like he was on news groups like posting stuff about this and he has a library of like over 100,000 pieces of literature and so when, he, when Lloyd Evans popped up like five years ago he, he messaged him and he donated a bunch of literature to Lloyd he's like Lloyd you need a library you're gonna need all this literature yeah I'll give you all my stuff <laughs> That was kind of cool. Oh, wow, cool, cool. Yeah. I didn't know there was like a, a cultural, um, uh, cultural like um, connectivity between people in the uh, in the, in that phase or in that in that that area, you know, in the XJW yeah. thing like that. Do you remember being at as assemblies and having like picketers? And yeah. People, like, I wonder whatever happened to that, if they still do that. It still happens. Um, there's kind of a controversial, in the ex Jehovah's Witness world, there's a sort of like controversial group called, um, I don't know they called, the Vast Apostate Army. And they were really yeah. active. Did you follow them at all or notice what they're up to? No, but I'm aware of them. Yes. Okay. Uh, somebody, somebody, well, yeah, I've been, I, I, I've had, I had, uh, I posted something on my blog a few weeks ago. I don't know, and somebody came and and commented or texted me or messaged me or something who I hadn't met before, and they said, um, they said, oh, I I discovered this post on the the vast apostate army. I don't know if you're a member, 
and oh. I was like, I was like, oh, um, no, but that was. Can I join the army? <laughs> <laughs> active, um, inactive soldier, ready to go. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I, I, I'm probably more interested in being a member of the Macintosh 68K Liberation Army, but uh, <laughs> personal, personal, uh, personal yeah. time at this point. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd sort of not, I did not really pay attention to anything in Exo's Witness World. All I knew was about Barbara Anderson, who Ross had taught, showed me like back when we were both witnesses and she had put together something called the Silent Lambs. It's oh, right. Lambs from the 90s and early 2000s. That was like the repository for letters about child sexual abuse. Yeah. And um, like victims and trauma would write, um, they would write their story and it would get published there publicly. So it's like when we looked at it, when we were witnesses, like over 2,000 or something letters. Maybe it was even higher, but at least a couple thousand. And, um, and that's still active. Yeah, and she's still going. She lives around here, I think. I just saw her on another podcast. Oh, wow. Um, All right. She's, yeah, still going. Well, speaking of podcasts, but, you want to start working uh, uh, working the agenda here? This has been very yeah. free form up to this point. Yeah, it is. I, I was thinking I'll have to cut an intro and then come back to this stuff, and then we can be free yeah. again later. Yeah, um, it works. But let me, yeah, I just want to finish that whole thing about the, the vast apostate army because I never, I'd not looked at all into this whole ex witness community on the internet until I wanted to make this thing. Like I'd already been out for like six years. And then I, I was like, okay, there's this, there's these people that are like crashing the kingdom hall meetings and they're like going up on stage and giving a prayer and, um, and they're like not in the religion. You know, it's like such a funny like break in the culture. Like they sat through the entire meeting and waited until the end to do the prayer. And they like went up on stage and like gave a prayer that got kicked out and, the, and the, like the cops would be called or something. And the elders are like, oh my God, we don't have bouncers. Uh, we're the bouncers, wow. damn it. And they like <laughs> ask the person to leave and they're, they're like live streaming the whole thing. Oh, I've seen a couple of these videos. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's so entertaining and i was like oh man these people are on the cutting edge of this whole scene and then i also discovered at the same time lloyd evans who's like the proper logical guy who's like got a professional podcasting thing even more so now back then he was like doing it out of like his bedroom it's like yeah a bed and like a duvet yeah but they were like there's a lot of people that are at odds but the vast hit posted army like really got together and put together a documentary in canada with a news agency out of toronto i believe um, and they put together a really amazing um, news style documentary about this whole thing. But yeah, they're very much activists. And there's a big activism. And I wonder, I guess there's like a passing of the torch, like every, every generation or every year new people leave and then they like get fired up and then join the thing and then it moves and moves like a wave forward in time. That's how well, I Well, that's, it. I mean, I think that's, I think that that's healthy, right? Like, I've always felt that if you spend the rest of your post-witness life living mentally in the witness world, you are still a, a witness. You're just a witness apostate or you're a witness. Right. You're, you know what I mean? Like, like culturally, you're still a witness and like yeah, your mind is still as a witness. Yeah. You're defining yourself. Your self-identity is still as a witness. But if you move on, mm. you know, it, that... If you move on, that's healthy for you, but other people still benefit from what you went through, right? So mm -hmm. there's you do need to kind of like get that to the next, the next wave, the next generation, or whatever. Right. They need like they're they're going to keep fresh. discovering the same things that you, yeah. were discovered by the previous people, by the previous people mm -hmm. going back to who knows how long, right? Um, how amazing of a gift it is to like come out and then be like oh here's this incredible body of work to like yeah. I need to catch up on this education and then once no. you get there then you can like it's, build something new on top of it it's fantastic I, I i i was talking to a friend of mine uh who i really only knew back when we were witnesses a um, long time ago but we're we've connected online since and and like i don't know a week or two ago he he hits me up on facebook and he just sort of out of the blue just just randomly says so how did you ever get past sort of feeling like there's no point because the because Armageddon's not going to happen and and just out of the blue just you know just ask this and I'm like 
this is an extremely common question for people who leave, right? Like you've got, mm-hmm. you got, you believe you spend your whole life, like focused on this goal of this thing happening that defines where everything's going. And then suddenly it's open-ended and then you're like, I haven't the, I have no idea what I want to do. And I never had to really think about it before um, because, you know, the script was already written. And um, so I wrote him back and I was like, what makes you think I did? You know, <laughs> what makes you think I got past that? Oh, like, I still, I still, you know, uh, have that. I just realized that it doesn't, that, you know, it is what it is. You're going to live your life and things are going to happen. And, uh, you know, um, psychologically, the damage is always still there, but um, I don't know. I think it's just really great that like there's a whole community of people who all have had very similar experiences in programming and then very similar experiences in leaving the programming and then deprogramming and deprogramming. And if you don't actively Mm. deprogram and like actively embrace a life other than a witness uh, or other than as an ex witness, then it really, it messes you up. Mm -hmm. So you have to do something about it. Yeah, you have to do something about it. Mm-hmm. And you, if you don't, pa- if you don't, like, you know, it's the people I feel bad for are the ones who never actively deprogram themselves. Right. They sort of you'll, stick with it. You'll find them like 10 or 20 years out of the religion. And they're for the first time realizing that they should learn something new or like that one of their questions, like one of their ideas of how reality works got shattered for the first time. Like they're mm-hmm. still waiting for the paradise or something. Yeah. Or feeling feeling depressed every for the, their whole adult life because they're not going to make it to paradise or something like that. Well, I mean, my my uncle has has stopped being a witness. He was a witness in the seventies and the early eighties. Mm-hmm. He has not been actively attending kingdom halls or being a witness in forty years, and yet he'll still say, "Well, I know it's the truth." Wow, <laughs> it is definitely yeah. not that. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, dude, you never got out. You never yeah. got out. You're still in as much as anybody else is mm-hmm. because you are still convinced that it's true. You just think you can't do it. So, I mean, that just means you just spend your life thinking you're living under a death sentence, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I know it's the truth, but I can't do it. So God's going to kill me, but I've come to grips with that or whatever, right? <laughs> And it's like, yeah. maybe it's just not even true. Maybe maybe you don't have to carry right. that weight around. I think luckily for both of us, we were both really interested in science and like yeah. the philosophy of people in the physics world and the astronomy world, like Carl Sagan and, um, yeah. Richard, heroes. Richard fucking Dawkins. Richard Dawkins yeah. is amazing. I, he has a whole chapter about Jehovah's Witnesses in God Delusion. Did you know that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've read yeah. it. Yeah, actually, oh, really? the book that you mentioned in the film, he talks about that exact book for an entire chapter of The God Delusion, which oh, is wow. amazing. I had no idea. Um, he just breaks it down because their argument is always like, he's, his whole thing that he breaks down in his chapter is the only argument that Jehovah's Witnesses has is that because it's beautiful, therefore God made it. Because a yes. flower is beautiful, therefore God made it. And that's proof of God's existence. And he Isn't just like breaks down the logic the the <laughs> illogic of that yeah um, i've it's been a while since i read god delusion i know i I've, I've told you this before but the book that that um i read that like the the the, the only the, the most subversive act of my life was when i read the blind watchmaker mm. and and i read it's it also like, his isn't it yeah it? yeah it says uh but that was after i discovered that that um the creation book was bullshit and then i was like okay fine i will read the other side and see i will give them a chance and the book i went to barnes and noble and the book that i picked as the evolution book i was going to read was going to see if they if they had anything for their side of it because the way i was thinking about it was if the um if the evolution folks were as full of crap as the creation folks then i could pick the side i wanted and it would because it would basically be like ah they nobody knows right it's coke versus pepsi Mm -hmm. stick with i can stick with coke (laughs) and um because i was kind of looking for you know um i was looking for that book to be bad 
So I went and I got the blind watchmaker and I brought it home and I, I hid it in my garage and I started reading it like on the sly, like porn or something, you know, it was like, <laughs> it was, it was, it the was, evolution it, centerfold. Yeah. It was like, Ooh, Richard Dawkins, you hottie. Uh, and, <laughs> but no, I seriously like, I, cause you know, you're not supposed to read the countervailing opinion you on know, anything you, that they teach right yeah, yeah. You, 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 there's nothing more transgressive than reading a book you're not supposed to read if you're a witness and I actively read that book and I literally was just like oh wow I can't find any I can't find any garbage here this is all right. rational this all mm -hmm. makes sense I was kind of pissed at him but I did meet him once at a oh really atheist convention thing that's cool and uh and i Where thanked at? him where'd you go was he in minneapolis or somewhere else he, um yeah he came here he had a book that was called like the purpose of purpose or something mm -hmm. like that and, or maybe it was not a book maybe it was just a presentation he was doing but he came to i want to say university of minnesota um like the, he did a uh talk and so I went to his talk and then after the talk, I think he was signing things or maybe it was, I think it might, might've been the American Atheist Conventions where I may have actually met him. So anyways, I think I saw him gave the talk once and then I, I met him briefly at a American Atheist thing. Very cool. What a hero, this guy. Yeah, yeah. He's, 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 a, he's a pretty grumpy dude though. He's, he's just like, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, I know. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> he's sort of over it. I well, feel like yeah. In his talks later in life, like he's an older guy now. Um, he was really fired up when he was like in his prime, like 30s to like 60s. And then mm -hmm. his, in his older age, he's way more chill and like calm, forgiving of people and maybe even more like just friendly because he's not so much on on like the rampage to like show Christians what the real what reality is like. <laughs> well, you know, there was that sort of brief period with the the new atheists where you know they were like your your uh your Dawkins your Hitchens these guys and they were really kind of leading with you know really making people um I don't know what's the word uh try to try to push for a cultural renaissance where people would open their eyes and be mm -hmm. you know based on reason and there was such a backlash against that mm -hmm. that I feel like they sort of um, they sort of backed off of it, right? Like we're not they were maybe they were like we're not helping as much as we want to be helping because I did notice that there was definitely yeah. sort of or maybe it was just I don't know maybe the media just stopped paying attention to say it was like it's old news, yeah, yeah. There's no God, we don't care, it doesn't sell. Um, but I did. I have noticed that that whole new atheism thing seems to have become less prevalent. Yeah, there was a lot of debates, and that was always interesting. Like, oh, so this atheist is going to, who's, he's been invited to go debate a Christian leader in a church, and he agreed to it. Like, why? Like, he's got an audience of 5,000 or 1,000 people in this church, mega church, who all support the preacher, but there's going to bring on one atheist into this room. Like, it's just a strange thing to agree to because they're not really even talking about the same topics. They're not experts in the same field. It's like having a physicist talk to like a manager of a grocery store. Like it's, it's a completely different world that they're in control of or understand well. Yeah, it's truly, it's truly bizarre that anybody would think there would be anything good that would come out of that. Yeah. Like those, like, those, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think that it gives, it gives the, it's kind of like, it's kind of like how uh, um, Fox News used to be when they would pretend that they had two sides, when they would be like, oh, here's the, per, here's the Democratic, or here's the person representing the left opinion, it would just be like a straw man, but it, it when you put two non-equal uh, parties together just so that you can claim you have equality you give too much credence it's really it, it strongly benefits one side and i think right, the creationist yeah. side benefits from uh people on the reality-based side um you know 
treating them as if it's a, it's a reasonable debate when that debate was settled 150 years ago. Right. And there's right. also, it's, I mean, in one way you have like new good ideas being presented to an audience that almost never has an opportunity to hear them. But the problem of them all hanging, all the people with like bad ideas they've believed their whole lives hanging out together is that as soon as that conversation is over, they're all going to reinforce <laughs> the things they were taught their whole lives and then forget about the conversation and the deep meaning that was there. Yeah. Because like culturally, you just, if you reinforce, if someone reinforces your own preconceived ideas, then you're probably not going to change your mind because there's like a, a big social pressure there to maintain your belief. Well, there is. And, and it's funny that it actually, well, you've had this experience, right? Where you go door to door and you, you meet up with somebody who decides to challenge you instead of just telling you not interested or instead of just saying, I have my own religion, I have my own religion. And you get into a, a debate and you, you wind up being put on the defensive you have to start looking up some scriptures you have to do some things you have to try mm -hmm. to defend the truth and it's kind of shakes you right because it makes you have to potentially doubt yourself and doubt what you believe but you're sitting there and you've got your you've got your reinforcement of the person you're at the door with or whatever and then the two of you walk off that step after that conversation and you both feel this sudden rush of like I went into the lion's den and I walked out. It's proof that Jehovah's got my back and I've totally got this. And you wind up suddenly feeling like you you weren't you weren't, you know, this close to being shown up as a moron. Instead, you had you had taken you had you had been challenged by by worldly thinking and you had been able to defend the truth. Mm -hmm. And then you totally you feel that like that's the kind of stuff that, you know, becomes the basis for some um, some piece on the assembly where people are giving their their mm -hmm. uh, experiences and they're saying yeah and then and then three months later that person I had the debate with they're they're here getting baptized today you know like and and so right. yeah there's definitely a thing where like having your beliefs challenged and having to defend them against that challenge winds up just reinforcing your beliefs even if you lose the debate even if right. you lose on every single damn point, you still wind up feeling like you came out ahead. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, I don't think it's a really good idea, to be honest. No, like the, I don't the, the, the debate format is just a bad, it's a bad yeah. format for getting at the truth about anything. It reminds me of a really embarrassing moment in my life. Um, in high school, my biology teacher knew what he was talking about with biology through and through. Definitely had a topic on evolution. We were studying the Revelation book of all books, which is, they don't, well, witnesses don't even use that anymore. Like it's, they tried it, they taught it three times in the book studies um, and they don't even allow it on their website anymore. Like it's, it's so filled oh, really? with nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I know this because I wanted to use it for another video that I did in Vietnam mm -hmm. with this witness, a, a Vietnamese woman who left, who joined the religion and then left the religion. And I wanted to page through it and look at, like look to the art of it. There's so much art in that book. Oh, it's a beautiful book, so, actually, in some so I, ways. I downloaded it, but I couldn't get it from the Jehovah's Witness website. I had to get it from an apostate website that kept the original version on the internet. So I downloaded it, had it printed in full color, so she could like go through and like read some parts of it. Wow! Uh, and it's like I've never put that stuff out in the world yet, but I will. It's pretty interesting. But um, what was funny is my biology teacher. We're we're going to the Revelation book in our book study weekly. And then I was like, well, this is the book of choice, I guess. So I'm going to give this to my biology teacher because this is the answer to evolution. <laughs> so <laughs> embarrassingly, after class one day, I like brought the revelation book and I was like, so my ch in my church, we're studying this book. And I think, you know, as, a, as someone who doesn't believe that God exists, like you might find God in this. It's like, here's this weird fantasy book. <laughs> it's not, it's like worse than the Bible itself, worse than the revelation book, in, the biblical revelation book in the Bible itself. It's like the, the Jehovah's Witness interpretation of how all the prophecy, all the weird stuff that's happening in the revelation in the book of, Bible book of Revelation is applies to the Jehovah's Witnesses only in this century. I'm like, right. You know, and he's like, I, definitely an atheist and i'm not going to read that and i was like well you have to take it because it's rude if you don't <laughs> and then and then people in my kingdom hall were like that's amazing I, I don't know what i told them i was like oh i gave the revolution book to my biology teacher that's like the what i told them and they're like 
uh-huh. can you do a part on the on the meeting like and i was like you want me to stand up on stage <laughs> and talk about this <laughs> embarrassing moment like i think everyone must just be lying every time they do a thing on stage because like that was the worst experience possible <laughs> but, like, who knows what that guy thought i have no idea he, i'm sure he doesn't uh, know that, he probably looked at that <laughs> the same way i just realized I'm wearing a red hat. I want it very clear. It's not a MAGA hat. This oh, is from good Bo- idea. This is from <laughs> Voices Motel on uh, Deer Island in Maine. Lovely place, Stonington. Uh, it's, it, not it's, MAGA. <laughs> it's a lovely place. It is not MAGA, but it is a red hat. I almost never want to wear a, a hat that's red anymore. I think, because... I think when we were filming at your house, you had a red hat on too. And then, of course, like I thought about it later. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> if you don't, if we cut this part he's gonna look like a MAGA guy I'm following and everyone's gonna turn off the turn the channel <laughs> oh man red hats have been ruined and the Minnesota twins have red hats you know oh, no. like right um <laughs> anyways it, it I bet you what you came across as is like that I told did I tell you about I told you about that 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 weird conspiracy theory guy who I met door to door that one time who told me about Matria and all that did I ever tell no, you about, about this okay so <laughs> This is awesome. Um, so this is about uh, 91, 92. It was it was about a, a year or two before X-Files premiered. So I was unfamiliar with the concept of conspiracy theorists mm-hmm. or conspiracy theories. Okay. Yeah. So I was pretty virgin about it. And I was a teenager. I was out in the, in, in the ministry with, uh, with a, a kid named Bobby Norbaum and with his sister and my brother and some other people. And we, we pull into this neighborhood. We're doing some, some territory and... <laughs> To go to this house and there's this little old man who answers the door probably mid 60s really uh really nice nice friendly guy he invites us in offers us coffee we sit down and he, we start talking about the latest watchtower and awake magazine and he goes totally off into this totally alternate universe that is just amazing he starts saying he's like okay boys let me stop you here all right i want to tell you something okay and then he hey did you know that there were 14 tribes of israel and that they all represent different countries and blah blah, blah and and i'm like okay um have no idea what you're talking about but uh no uh here here's a scripture that mis- disproves whatever you just said i don't remember the specifics and the dude reaches out takes his bible out and starts just schooling me on scripture right like he's jumping from place to place connecting dots rewriting the whole bible according to a completely different theology that he has that is all based on the same witness type thinking it's all based on uh end times it's all based on uh prophecy the book of daniel revelations all this stuff but he has a completely alternate theory and he's extremely good at it and i start kind of like feeling like i gotta get the hell out of here like you know this guy is i can't i can't make any progress here and he doesn't want us to leave and because he's got a he's got an audience you know how many people you probably tried to talk to until you two walked up to the door like, oh no yeah. One wants to listen to this. This guy was just like, "Welcome <laughs> to my parlor," says the spider to the fly, right? And we're just like the trapped witnesses. But then he goes and says, "He says, and and all of this is is happening today, and and I am part of an underground network of people who are aware of this." And I said, uh-huh. and he's like, "We have computers, and we talk to each other." And again, this is pre internet like was not public internet yet and wow. he was on bbs systems hmm. with with his dial up with with other people who were into this conspiracy and he says wow. and i got to tell you about matria and i says well okay and he says you know about matria i said no i don't know who matria is and he says matria is the devil but he pre- he appears at the the un and he tells people about uh, he tells the world leaders what they should do and then but he just appears and then he disappears he says and you can't take a picture of him and I said okay all right and he says and then like 10 minutes later he's like I have a photo of Matria that I got from these people on the internet or not the internet because it wasn't the internet but he's like I have a picture of Matria do you want to see it 
and he wanted us to go down into his basement with him. And that was when I was kind of like, he's going to kill us. Drawing the line. You know? <laughs> and so, that. and yeah. so I'm like, no, so you can't take a picture of him, but you have a picture of him. I mean, I was like, the guy was just kind of out there. So finally I was like, you know what, sir, we have to leave. We have uh, people waiting for us on the car and, you know, we have to go. And so we sort of, we escaped the next day. I get up in the morning, I head out to go go uh, out the front door of the house at my parents' house. There's a book sitting on our front step with all of this crazy shit that this oh, guy did was he telling follow us. follow you home? He, he found out where, where I lived somehow. Wow. And he That's put, scary. he left this book <laughs> on scarier. our step. I know. It's one thing I to know. like meet a crazy person in their own home and then leave them yeah. in their house and never talk to them again. <laughs> Another when, one to have them follow you across the entire city. I remember there was a point where I told him, I was just like, dude, if any of this was true, there would be books in the library and stuff that would have this. And and I work at the library and there's nothing like this. And he's like, he's like, the, the governments, they control the libraries. They don't want you to know about this. And, and so anyways, uh, so in one day, in one visit, I basically learned conspiracy theories. I learned underground networks of kooks. I learned a whole, whole bunch of stuff that all like, couple years later i saw the x-files and i'm like oh yeah that's, that's the guy and then and then when the internet uh kook started and the web sort of became a thing i, I started seeing this pop up I, I flash back to that dude all the time it was like 35 years ago at this point but man i think about him you didn't need the internet for it apparently no you could do it on dial up it was yeah. on the old, B, the, old the, the bulletin board systems and mm. i've even googled matria since you know mm -hmm. do you find anything interesting Found pictures. Yeah. Okay. Someone actually took a picture of this guy. <laughs> yeah. Apparently. So, anyways, I think that's how you looked to your high school teacher. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> sure. I mean, that's. I really feel like Joe's Witnesses are a conspiracy theory faith. Like they believe oh, yeah. that only they have the true knowledge, and everyone else is wrong. Not just like a little bit wrong, like all the way wrong to the point that like Jesus will murder them himself. Um, mm -hmm. well and, tell me you you don't look at QAnon and recognize the same oh, same type yeah. of thinking oh I see cult thinking in so many things that are going on in society right now mm -hmm. um, just the entire like the people that stormed the capital in the insurrection like the yeah. kind of the kind of belief that you have to have to take that kind of action is 100% mm -hmm. cult thinking it's completely manipulated um, it's reinforced by being in a bubble and like Jehovah's Witnesses are very closed off. Like they don't get to have, even if they get new, new ideas, they might bring those new ideas up to people in their community and then they're shut down. If you yeah. like the reasoning book, the reason from the scriptures book, it had an idea called thoughts. Uh, Conversation stoppers was like their mm -hmm. this terminology. So if somebody says, I don't really have time for this, you can like put your foot in the door and say a couple words and get them to keep talking. Like they teach you all these methods to like, if somebody says I'm not interested, oh, well, are you not interested in the Bible? And you try to like, you, you pivot and you try to get them to, it's, it's very manipulative and, um, and it does work. And it's very, it's also very salesy and you, and you see it in the sales world, but. Um, but you know, what's interesting, yeah, if you uh, combine that with the theocratic mystery school handbook where they talk about what makes for an honest argument, they actually mm -hmm. dis discuss this about in a, um, I can't remember which which one it's what, what section it's in, but there's a thing about how to build an honest argument, right? Like hmm. how not to commit logical fallacies and how oh, really? to build. A, yeah, That's surprising. Okay. Yeah, they talk about that in the. That's their number the, one thing they do in like every article they have ever written is make logical fallacies. <laughs> I I know, but they have special pleading for when they do it, you know. But <laughs> right. <laughs> but it, it, it's interesting that it's not like they're not aware. The, of the yeah. tech of the techniques right oh they're masters of breaking well doing making all the logical fallacies but like keeping you interested in paying attention yeah yeah what i was going to say is what what they're what they do um instead of conversation stoppers when you're in the from people on the outside of the religion people that are in the religion if you bring up an idea that is contrary to someone's belief someone inevitably in the group it's like it's almost like a race to see who can shut you down the fastest because as soon as someone can shut you down from talking about a topic 
or mm -hmm. thinking in, on a certain line that's deviant from what the religion teaches, that raises them up on a pedestal. And then they get to brag about how they shut you down to other people and then how like they're higher than you. Like they, they're elevating themselves to this higher level um, in the hierarchy of the culture and in the religion and will get props from other people and they can like, brag about how they shut you down and how you're like weak spiritually or something just for if you bring up an idea that is not 100% down the line. Well, I it mean, it's all, it's all competitive, really. Mm -hmm. You know, like everybody's trying to, trying to, uh, uh, you know, make their way to the paradise. They want to, what's the word, advance spiritually. Yeah. Right. Like, it, which is just so funny. The 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 theocratic, uh, even the whole idea of a theocracy of like that. There's like a there's a hierarchy of value from like a publisher to a ministerial servant to an elder to a the presiding prime, overseer. Prime, yeah. Blah blah. All the way up to Jehovah. Circuit overseer. Right. Like, right yeah. It's this structural uh, concept of of a hierarchical hierarchical bureaucratic mm -hmm. um religious theocracy that starts from god and works its way down to you know brother jones in the literature desk mm -hmm. and everybody wants their place in it and they all want to go up a place up to whatever their comfort level is but it's such a weird way of thinking about spirituality because it's like this it, that completely divorces you it makes you compete against your other the other people in, in it with you there's and nothing also, spiritual about it. It's there's more, nothing spiritual. <clears throat> yeah. It's more like a corporate situation where you're climbing the corporate ladder and fighting to get there because there's only a few spots. Like everyone's and, fighting to like get elevated. Yeah. And we didn't, I mean, if you think nobody ever stops and thinks about the word theocratic, but that's literally what it means, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have autocratic, you have bureaucratic, you have theocratic. The government run by the religious group. Yes. Yeah. And we were in the theocratic ministry school. Right. How, we to, were in the how to be theocratic... part of the government. <clears throat> it's mind boggling. I never actually stopped and thought about that. Like mm -hmm. very much like it's actually a government mm -hmm. and you're working your way up through the structure of that government. Yeah. And, it's and so nothing all those things are the all. same. All those things are the same in the actual government. Like the same kind of nonsense happens. The oh, same totally. kind of bureaucracy, the same, the paperwork, the, um, like the getting scolded in elders meeting about some dumb thing you did that doesn't fit the corporate policy. You got to turn in your time. Oh man, I resisted. I, I decided one day, I was like, if this is really true, if this is a real God, he doesn't need a piece of paper that proves that I did it. If I did it, I did it. And he's, he's, if he's a real deity, then he cares. And I got so much, so much shit for that. Um, but for a while, I, I like for like the last three years I was in, I was like auxiliary pioneering, like pretty regularly, like 50 hours a month of donking on doors. And I'm not proud of it, but that's what I did. And I, I refused to put in the time slip. And the, wow. people, the people in charge wanted that time slip because that makes them look good. It makes them look good to the person who's tra the traveling overseer. Uh -huh. the overseer. Uh -huh. They want to see like their numbers improving. And if there's some kid like knocking out hours. And it's not on the books. It doesn't help them rise up. <laughs> That's amazing. You were actually just doing the work, but not putting in the time. You weren't even getting the credit. Right. Yeah. Why? Why bother doing it then? <laughs> See, I believed. I guess. I believed at that point. <laughs> I, on some well, level. I mean, I believed I mean. too. I was more likely to turn in time for time I didn't do, though. <laughs> the opposite. <end>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I figure that must, that must have happened a lot because like you'll get you'll you'll lose socially you'll lose out um if you don't have at least like 10 hours yeah i mean you'll get that you'll get that knock on the well not a knock on the door but you'd get a i would get the, the occasional the conversation phone call. Yeah. yeah the phone call brother did you did you did you forget to turn in your time this month and i'll be like oh yeah, Let me write yeah, down a believable amount of hours. And they'd be like, how many hours did you get? And I'd be like, seven. You do better next sure. month? Sure. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it was seven. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I rarely didn't go out at all. I mean, and I, mm -hmm. I pioneered at, at one point or well, 
couple different points in time. I, I, I auxiliaried. I never did the full-time pioneer thing, but neither. Um, there was this yeah. brochure that came out right when you were leaving the religion and maybe you remember it is like, what are you going to do with your life? The brochure. Um, I don't know. It was like, it was like, these are the, and it was for men. There's nothing that women can do in this thing. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> it was like, you can become, you can be, go to Bethel. You can go to become a missionary and leave the country, like go to some far flung place. Mm -hmm. um, you can become an elder. You can become a ministerial servant. Um, or you can go where the need is great. These and all sound like, like great plans. I was like, this, this is garbage, 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 garbage. <laughs> The need is great sounds interesting because that's like maybe an exotic country that sounds like an adventure so i yeah. was like if i'm gonna do that like rip <laughs> this one thing <laughs> um then i have to go through all i was like how do i do this thing to go on the adventure and then um because I, I knew a bunch of people have been to dr in minneapolis uh, dominican mm -hmm. republic and i was talking to them when they came back home to visit and then go back to dr and it's like their life sounds amazing it was basically like a college life you're like 22 you're out in this other country, you're hanging out with other people who are travelers and you're living in this exotic place that's tropical and amazing sounding, especially in the winter in Minneapolis. Sounds amazing. <laughs> and, and so I like, I figured out like, well, if I have to like get a, rec a letter of recommendation for my congregation, well, that's never happening. Cause like, I'm this like guy on the fringes who doesn't turn in his time. Um, and who's like, you know, has a girlfriend who's not a witness or whatever, you know, there's rumors. And he plays in a band with other people who aren't witnesses. So I was like, that's never happening. So how much is a plane ticket? Oh, I have to say $400 and then I can do whatever the hell I want. So I was like, I'm just going to like skip this <laughs> whole brochure <laughs> and I'm just going to buy a plane ticket because that just skips all the hoops. And I did that. I, and people put up with me in Ecuador. <laughs> nice. It's kind of nice. cool. I had a great adventure. I learned to surf. I hiked some crazy volcanoes, the tallest volcano in the world and like met locals and learn like just had an inch, amazing like half a year and you did that as a witness you just, you just witness, blew yourself out there in debt on a credit card and i spent wow. 200 dollars a month and rent cost 50 bucks a month to live on the sand on the beach on the on the pacific ocean um it was amazing and so i went door to door and i learned spanish and i did it in spanish for like i don't know i was terrible at my spanish but you know you try and um that was a huge amazing life experience Wow, that is very awesome. formative. Very formative. Yeah, cool. I, I, I would love to say I had ever done anything even remotely that um, ambitious in in as far as the witness life was concerned. But I mean, to be honest, I wasn't doing it because I was like, I really, really want to be a missionary, and I believe everything. I was like, I'm putting up with this shit, and uh, if these are the only options, like I'm traveling. And no, but I like, you know what, if more, if more witnesses were ambitious like that, I'd like be like, you know, I can either wait for the society to send me to Ecuador or I can send myself to Ecuador and I can just do stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I bet you that would have been a very, uh, would have been a very, like, it, I think that the, the, the Watchtower Society before it turned all bureaucratic under Nor back in like the 40s or 50s or whenever, like after Rutherford, that's when it all became like this technocratic, bureaucratic, theocratic thing. I think that people would have been like more along that way of thinking back in the early, early days, right? If you like just said, simpler. hey, I'm just going, I just bought a plane ticket. I'm going, I'm doing the thing. I'm going to learn the language, right? Like now it's, it's like you have to follow the structure of the the you know jehovah's arrangements about everything and mm -hmm. nobody ever would even think to just short circuit the line like that i like that yeah, yeah it's it good things about you <laughs> yeah thanks <clears throat> i saw your first your first bullet there i might have to uh i might have to run downstairs and <laughs> and, uh, and and do that because why not uh, okay. we'll, we'll break i'll stop recording and then come back all right it. sounds like he's the guy who produced like all of the best albums that anybody put out Googling in Brian the last know now. 50 years and i let's see am i embarrassed he's the ambient music guy he's the <clears throat> guy who invented ambient music wow really music right. for airports <laughs> <laughs> really? music for music films for is actually one of his albums he's got a 
He's got uh, an album called Music for Films. I have heard of him. I definitely recognize his face. Um, but I suck if I don't know who he is. All right. That's why I like talking to you. I always learn something. Back in the... <laughs> Eno, oh. in 1973, put on an album called Here Come the Warm Jets, one of my favorite records of all time. And uh, this is a picture from around that time period. You have a picture? Peter Gabriel, Robert Fripp. No, I'm saying on my oh. shirt. This is, oh, oh, this, oh. Is, right. this is this is glam, glam era Eno. But cool. Eno worked with Bowie on, uh, on a bunch of stuff, worked with Peter Gabriel, Robert Fripp, U2, like everybody's worked with Dino. I need a. Cool. Oh, I gotta get my good lighter. Hold on a second. I'm almost ready. I think it's a I promise. It's like ten it's years. Civilized. Ten years does that. Like you're ten years older than me, roughly. Um, there's uh -huh. just like another decade of knowledge that you just have that the next generation just doesn't. Have. <laughs> yeah, you acquire you acquire things over time. Funny how that works. I'm sort of like. And. Uh, I've been diving into um, 1970s music documentaries over the last year, basically during the pandemic. Not like that's it, but oh, fun. every time I see one, I'm like, ooh, what is this? What happened? I just watched a great one on Ro Roku, has like a free, has a bunch of free media on it. And there was a 1970s documentary about the punk rock, punk rock in England, specifically um, with the fashion of punk rock in England. Um, and there's one store called Sex <clears throat> that sold like vintage clothes at that time in the 70s like 50s and 60s clothes and it was like railing against yeah. the hippie movement it was it's a it was a fascinating documentary and they got some of the big time you know punk rock people in it it's pretty pretty cool i love that stuff i love music documentaries it's like what's well, the name of that doc channels. i would love to watch that i will i don't remember i just watched it and then went moved on but i will make a note to let you know all right yeah i really love those uh those documentaries and i actually I, I love that whole time period of of music that 70s punk scene type stuff you know the um that and the post wave you know but like i've always been a huge fan of clash talking heads mm -hmm. sex pistols x-ray specs uh you know uh the iggy pop bowie's uh late 70s stuff the berlin records i mean that's all been my jam for i think i kind of my gateway drug was talking heads yeah i remember getting uh uh like when they were still together in the 80s when they did um the video for uh road to nowhere off of what was that little creatures um i remember just falling in love with that and then I wound up getting Fear of Music and some other other stuff. And I don't know. I used to have a thing. What I would do is I would hear about any artist. Um, and I would immediately start researching who their influences were and who they influenced. Mm -hmm. And I would draw out these little maps where I would connect all the musicians to each oh. other. And then I would go explore off the map. So I'd be like, okay, um, I liked this Talking Heads record. Like, okay, so who else has Talking Heads worked with? Oh, Talking Heads had a member of their band was Felicuti or something, right? And then like I would like just branch. Oh, and so that's how I would explore did. music. Yeah. I had yeah, a similar yeah, thing. I would I be like, and then I would or... I'd be like, <clears throat> yeah I, I had to use the library and stuff at the time um this is my cool little uh vintage uh lighter, lighter. that's got a built-in <laughs> cigarette case oh nice <laughs> and it's one of those old old school like nice so you can't it's uh it uses lighter fluid which will spoil your cigar they have to use a cheater fill so uh, light it with the cedar spill Hmm. Can you put the cedar out after that? Mm -hmm. Where are you burning your house down? One or the other. We had All right. Cigars. We had a birthday party last weekend. 
That's good. Pandemic birthday party. And we had my buddy, my roommate, actually. Um, he's big into cigars. So you guys would get along. He brought a bunch of little little ones. I can't remember what they're called, but um, so we all smoked little stogies out on the deck and drank some whiskey straight. Nice. It was nice. That was how we started. But it was a good night. <laughs> oh, I got I got my uh, my twelve year single malt and my cigar. Nice. So now nice. we can we can cheers. Cheers. This is my gin and tonic. That's not that's not whiskey. I had whiskey at the beginning. All right, gin and tonic's good. <laughs> got to change it up. Oh yeah, I saw that. All right. Yeah, uh, for whiskey, by the way, go. I got a bottle of blue, uh, Johnny Walker blue for my birthday, my 40th. It's mm -hmm. like a crazy expensive top of the line bottle. And it's really good. And I also got a bottle of, um, uh, what's the famous one? It's a, it's a scotch. Macallan. I, got a, like, I think it's a 12 or 15 year Macallan, something like that. Oh. Super nice. But my roommate nice. got a bottle of something called Lagavulin. Also scotch, a scotch, single malt. Lagavulin. Yeah. Lagavulin. Yeah. It's amazing. Yep. Wow. It's so good. <laughs> I can't believe it. Yeah. So a birthday we sipped on a bunch of well, that. Uh, two, two. Hmm. Happy birthday. Thanks. <laughs> also, you, I don't have you by 10 years. I only have you by seven if you're 40. Oh, seven. Okay. 47. All right. Yeah. 47 Max. not 50 yet I give said me, roughly give me, I said give me roughly. a couple more years yeah you're still in your mid-40s you're solid that's in. true <laughs> I'm still in my mid-40s I just I just turned 47 so you know well I mean couple, September right on uh, so yeah you if you want any really solid scotch recommendations I'll I'll uh I'll throw some at you okay 